Today, over 300 million people are facing high levels of food insecurity, more than double the number from 2020. All over the world, from our neighbors across the street to families an ocean away, people are struggling to fulfill this fundamental human need. The global food crisis is the result of a deadly combination of forces. Over 70% of people facing food insecurity live in conflict zones. Environmental damage caused by climate change destroys crops and people's livelihoods. And price inflation threatens to make food unaffordable for consumers. A challenge this great requires cooperation, coordination, and partnerships at a scale never seen before. To meet this moment, we must ask ourselves, who else needs a seat at the table? One example of a partnership-driven solution can be seen in the work of CGI commitment maker TechnoServe. They collaborate with smallholder farmers and communities around the world to find solutions that uplift their lives and livelihoods. Solutions that support biodiversity and climate positivity, foster long-term economic growth, and honor local traditional practices that have been effective for centuries. Desde que participo de, de los adiestramientos del Tecnocer, he, he mejorado mucho en práctica. Regenerative agriculture can make a meaningful difference for millions of people worldwide. A mí me motiva levantarme todos los días, darle un futuro mejor a mi hijo. Partnering with communities and with each other is the only path forward in the global fight against food insecurity. In this critical moment we face, it's time to make sure that everyone has a seat at the table. Please welcome Bishop William J. Barber II. To you all. It's good to be here this morning. I, let me take it with you. I just recently came through surgery, so it's good to be seen and not viewed. <laughs> Let's give a big hand of applause to this global, Clinton Global Initiative. <clears throat> Yesterday, President Clinton opened this convening and dialogue with Pope Francis. I have the privilege of serving on the Pope's, one of the Pope's advisory groups in, over in the Vatican uh, with economists like Jeffrey Sachs and others. And President Clinton referenced Isaiah 58, which is a call for each of us to use our voice and our action to stop injustice in its many forms. In fact, it actually opens with cry loud Spare not, lift your voice like a trumpet. And my Jewish rabbi friends tell me that that phrase is kol shofar. It means your voice like a trumpet. But interestingly enough, kol is also the same word for vote. So in, in Hebrew, vote and voice are the same words. If we pay people a living wage, if we invite the poor into our homes, then Isaiah 2,600 2, years ago says, we shall then be called repairers of the breach. Now Isaiah 58 has been one of the foundational scriptures of my pastoral work over 40 years now. And the work of repairs of the breach, the organization I lead, and also it's a critical passage of scripture for the new center for public theology and public policy at Yale that we are building. It is the work of the organization, both of them, is to train people from all walks of life to be moral leaders in whatever sector of society or industry they find themselves. Because Isaiah says everybody has a coal shofar. Everybody has a voice that must be lifted. As I've traveled across this nation from 
Binghamton, New York, to Birmingham, Alabama, from the Delta to um, San Francisco in the trenches of homelessness and to Appalachia. The one question I get most often from people is, how do you keep pace? How do you continue to work of social justice in the face of so much uh, meanness? How do you keep commitment? How do you keep going? When the breaches in our society and around the world seem to get larger and deeper, extreme poverty, not only abroad but at home, disastrous climate change, just left Jacksonville, where governors whose lips continue to spew hate and violence has created an ethos where just a few weeks ago a young man felt it was okay to go in and shoot people, three innocent lives motivated by hate, a pandemic that took millions of lives across the world, not just due to the germ or the virus, but due to the lack of health care, food insecurity. How do you keep going? Well, Isaiah reminds us that the hope of the repair demands that we first must face the breaches. We cannot ignore the realities. When I asked the former UN Special Rapporteur on extreme poverty and human rights, Philip Austin, some years ago, why is there so much extreme poverty in my own country? He said plainly to me, the issue is not a scarcity of resources. Don't let anybody tell you we don't have enough because whenever we want to go to war, we can find enough. He said, the issue is not a scarcity of ideas. We actually know how to end poverty. We just saw it uh, during the pandemic. We took child income tax credit, did a little bit, reduced poverty by 50%, but the problem is holding on to it, keeping it alive. The issue is not a scarcity of ideas. The issue is not a scarcity of resources. The issue is a scarcity of moral consciousness. Moral consciousness. And then he said to me, I'm not a religious person, Bishop Barber, but I know a God-sized problem when I see one. And I know when people of faith ought to be engaged. When you have what you need to fix a problem, but you refuse to do it, that's a moral issue. When state legislatures and congresspersons and senators say it's not their duty to ensure that people have living wages and free lunches for hungry children at school. But it is their duty to make sure that corporations have more in a country where 400 people earn an average of $97,000 an hour while people can get arrested simply for fighting for $15 an hour. That's a moral problem. When politicians ignore rapid climate change and destroy sacred indigenous lands like what's happening right now to the Apache people in Arizona just to exploit the earth for monetary gain, we have a moral problem. When we call people essential workers during a pandemic, but then we don't pay them a living wage or guarantee that they have paid leave or health care, this is a moral problem. And if we have a moral problem, then we must have a moral approach to solving them. And while I believe that we must look out into the world to find common ground and connect with each other to solve global crises, we must also look inward to assess our own moral standing and contribution to the cries. You know, sometimes one of my, the country I love flaws, and I'm, and I'm in line because one of our him says, men die in every flaw. One of our flaws is our ability to point the finger to the outside world while the rest of, and the rest of the world without looking inwardly. You know, a scholar in California revealed something earlier this year that ought to make all of us say, whoo. He did a study and found out that in America, Poverty is the fourth leading cause of death, higher than homicide, higher than respiratory disease, higher than the deaths from diabetes and, and gun violence. And yet every night you see on the news stories about homicide, 
but you don't hear stories about people dying from poverty? Why is there no Surgeon General's warning on a low-wage job? These are moral issues that we must face. And we must face them especially now because we are in a time, whether it's in Brazil or Nigeria, uh, uh, here in this country, uh, even in Israel now, we see this rise of autocratic leadership, hateful movements. And you know, autocratic, hateful, homophobic movements down through history all have six elements. The first element is evil economics. And that is that as long as you're going to get more money, it doesn't matter how you do it. The second element is sick sociology, the teaching that there has to be a hierarchy in society. Some folk have to be down, and other folk have to be up. The other is bad biology. That is the teaching that merely the incident of birth makes you different. The incident of birth makes you uh, inferior to other people. Political pathology is another uh, one of those uh, tendencies, one of those uh, uh, immoral ethics, if you will, of autocratic, hateful, homophobic movements. Political pathology, when the politicians are all about power and control rather than about making society better. Revisionist chronology is the fifth element. When history is retold to make the oppressor look good and the oppressed look bad, where the oppressed are blamed for their oppression, or whether when you just try to write history out and ignore it. And the sixth element of autocratic, hateful, homophobic uh, movements down through history is heretical ontology, the belief that God intended the oppressor to be in control. That's why almost every autocratic type movement positions itself as some kind of a messiah. I and only I, we've heard that in this country, can fix this. We have a moral problem and we need a moral approach. So what is the solution? Well, I'm a country boy and a story once, once told about two farmers sitting on the bank of a river and they saw babies floating down the river. One farmer jumped in and got a baby out and brought him back to the shore. Another baby came down. Another farmer went, the farmer went back in, got the baby out and brought him back in. The other farmer got up and started walking upstream. The farmer said, aren't you going to help me get these babies out of the water? The other farmer said, no, I'm going upstream to figure out how they're being thrown in in the first place. The solution is both and. We have to help people in the time of crisis, but we also have to face what causes the crisis in the first place. You know, it's God's work to meet the very immediate and extreme needs people across the globe face. That's God's work, providing meals, filling the gaps in education, health care. But it's also God's work, and it's something that Jesus committed his earthly ministry to, to put a stop to the principalities that were causing people to go hungry, that caused people to go sick, to be sick, that caused people to be over both and not either or. To be called to be repairs of the breach, we must put a stop to injustice at its roots. And in the face of so many challenges and with limited time, either one of these could be a whole semester of teaching. Let me just outline them and you can take them up later. First, a moral approach understands that racism, systemic racism, poverty, food insecurity, ecological devastation, immigration, denial of health care, the war economy, militarism, and the false moral narrative of religious nationalism are interlocking injustices. Could you say that with me? Interlocking injustices. Say that. And, they, and therefore, they must be challenged in an intersectional moral fusion way. There, yes, there are times we can operate in our, in our silos, but when civilization itself is in crisis, we must find a way to unite and come together and understand 
that many times the same forces that promote racism are the same forces that promote ecological devastation. The same forces that promote ecological devastation are the ones that su uh, support uh, the mistreatment of immigrants. The same ones that promote the in in mistreatment of immigrants support the denial of health care. And if they are cynical enough to be together, we ought to be smart enough to come together. <laughs> Secondly, a moral approach centers the people who are most impacted. The Bible says in Isaiah 58, only when you put the poor at the center of public policy can you repair the breaches. You can't put the poor as an aside. Only when you start with how will this policy impact the least of these, the rejected, the, the most vulnerable among us, paying living wages, stop blaming the victims for their oppression, what Isaiah says. Stop using religion as a cover for oppression. Only when we do that can we repair the breaches. In order to defeat autocracies and hateful movements, the poor and those who have been pushed to the margin must be central to our solution because mean, hateful autocracies and demagoguery type, demagogue type movements, they play on the poor and the least of these. You know what, I've caught, traveled all over this country, what the poor of this country say, poor and low wealth. I asked them why many of them have disengaged, why many of them don't vote. They say, Reverend Barber, nobody comes to talk to us anymore. Nobody talks to us. The church doesn't talk to us oftentimes. Politicians don't talk to us. We hear about the middle class and the wealthy, but nobody comes in. And when we leave people outside of even the narrative, we only open them up to receive counterfeit deliverance from those who are really out to just use them for their own financial gain. And America has a particular obligation when it comes to poverty and insecurity. You know, we still don't measure poverty right in this country. Amen, lights. People tell us it's only 39, 40 million poor people. That's not true. There are 140 million poor and low wealth people in this country prior to COVID. 43% of the nation, 51% of our children, over 87 million people who are uninsured or underinsured before COVID. 350,000 people died during the pandemic from the lack of health care. Almost every southern state where one third of all the poor and low income people live denied Medicaid expansion. We still are only one of the only 25 wealthiest countries that does not provide some form of universal health care. We have not raised the minimum wage in over 14 years, even though 60 years ago at the March on Washington, the first demand of the March on Washington was to raise the minimum wage to 75% to a living wage. Poverty measurement is out of date. Millions right here live in food de deserts. Millions get up every morning, can buy unleaded gas, and can't buy unleaded water. Over 50 cents of every discretionary dollar goes into the war economy today. And yet, when we have national elections, those seeking to lead this country are most often never asked, how are your policies going to directly address poverty and low wealth? Think about it. When is the last time you've heard of 30 minutes of a presidential debate focused on poverty and low wealth. In a country where nearly 50% of the people are poor and or low wage or low wealth. Joseph Stiglitz, a good friend of mine, an economist, he says, we asked the wrong question. The question we often ask is, how much will it cost? The wrong question. We should be asking, how much does it cost? to have 51% of the children living in poverty or low wealth? How much does it cost to have 87 plus million people uninsured or underinsured? Poverty cost us more to keep it as it is than it would be to fix it as it ought to be. <laughs> and until Amer right here in America, we can deal fully addressing poverty and the realities caused by it, we undercut our own moral authority to address the rest of the world. We must lead in this move to end and eradicate poverty and low wealth, and we can do it. Number three, a moral approach must be rooted in love. 
You cannot beat hate with hate. You cannot beat oppression with just another form of oppression. Perfect love cast out of fear. Autocratic hateful movements are rooted in fear. We must build movements rooted in deep love for humankind, love for everybody, regardless of who they love, regardless of their skin color, regardless of their economic station, regardless of their disability. There's a great scripture in the Bible, Psalms 118. It's one of the most powerful scriptures in all of the, the Bible. The rabbis, I love it when they read it. It says, the stone that the builders rejected has now become the chief cornerstone. And then it says, and this is the Lord's doing. Whenever the rejected are all welcomed in society and understood that love requires us to build a cornerstone of society, out of and with the very people who've been pushed aside. That is the only way we can overcome hateful movement. Fourthly, a moral approach requires us to commit to moral principles, whether it's the biblical call to stop injustice or even our Constitution's call. And though our Constitution was written by flawed men, there are some principles there that are bigger than America. I love them. They, they, you could actually use them across the world, like establish justice provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare. Yes, welfare is in the Constitution. I don't know why we took it out of everything else. <laughs> uh, and ensuring domestic tranquility. And lastly, a moral approach calls us always to never compromise our values. That's how you keep going. You wake up in the morning, you plant your feet, and you say, if, even if I fall, I'm falling forward, but I'm not falling backwards. Dr. King. <laughs> said it, and I repeat it here, that when you're in a hostile world, you've got to declare eternal opposition to injustice. In other words, until I die. I'm going to be a lover. Until I die, I'm going to fight for what's right. Until I die, I'm going to stand for justice. Until I die, I'm going to love people. Until I die, I'm going to believe that poverty does not have to be the way it is. And as I close today, I'm reminded of a too often forgotten anthem. I, I think if we say it long enough, somebody might stand up in the audience and actually sing it right from the audience. But it's not we shall overcome. Y'all know that one, right? We shall overcome. But that wasn't the anthem of the movement when they were in the street. You know, they were singing, we shall overcome in the, in the church when, when, when things were cool. But when they were in the street, there was a song they sung that had an attitude of eternal dissatisfaction. It's an anthem of the movement. Now, the English is bad. All of our teachers in here, the English is bad. <laughs> you know. And I, got, and I have all these doctoral degrees. I know how to put my syntax in, but, but, but it, that doesn't work when you're in the street. <laughs> that, that doesn't work when you're out there fighting against injustice. And, 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 and the anthem simply looked at injustice. The anthem would, would look at injustice right in the eye. It would look at a bomb right at, right at the bomb. It would look at the bullets. It would look at the water hoses. It would look at a governor whose lips were dripping with the words of interposition and nullification. It would look at setbacks. It would look at children blown up in churches. And with moral authority, the anthem said, all that might be true, but I ain't going to let nobody turn me around. And they would sing that as the backbone of the movement, that they believed that right eventually we'll win if you stay at it. And no matter what we face today, we have to declare in this moment, in our moment, because it's time for us to ante up, this is our moment. Yes, we're in a crisis of civilization. Yes, we're in a crisis of democracy. 
Yes, there's some mean folks out here. Yes, we've got some demagogues. Yes, we, we have people telling us we don't have enough funding. But somebody's got to declare we're going to keep on keeping on. Yes, we've got a Supreme Court that has rolled back voting rights and women's rights and LGBTQ rights and affirmative actions in just the span of a year. Yes, we see autocrats breaking out all over the world. Yes, we see mean people. But if somebody could start singing in their heart, ain't going to let nobody turn us around. I wonder, are any of those folk in this room this morning? I wonder, is that the attitude of this conference this morning? You know, it's all right to stand up and look at your neighbor. Stand up and look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, I want to be sure who I'm standing with. Are you in that crowd? that is going to declare, ain't going to let nobody no injustice, no hate, no wrong, no bad policy, no mean president, no mean governor, no mean dictator. Turn us around. Not now. Not ever. Welcome Padma Lakshmi. Hello, hello. That was exciting, right? I want him every day to say something in my ear when I get up. I want to welcome you all, and I want to thank very profusely Dr. Bishop Barber. Uh, what an amazing, just <laughs> inspiring way to start our day today. Um, this morning, we also want to address the critical importance of food in our society, both its production and its availability to all. You may know that the world is facing dual challenges in the coming years that will strain our food system. First, climate change, bringing a toll of extreme heat, storms, as well as rising sea levels, and then growing populations, with the global population forecasted to reach 9 million by just the end of this century. These competing demands will challenge our food system and all of us to ensure that human dignity is met through access to critical nourishment. I want to welcome all of you to join us at, at our table to discuss both sustainable production of food and the delivery of that food to those populations most in need. And I think we all have a role to play but first, I want to recognize some extraordinary members of the CGI community who have new commitments to action. I'd like to call up to stage Adi Bittler of Nilus. Where are you? Are you coming out from back? Hi. As well as Maya Patel of Tarsadia, Isabel Camariza of Solid Africa. Hello. Zach Wyatt of Carolina Farm Trust. And Florence Reed of Sustainable Harvest International. Thank you. 
Today, more than 300 million people worldwide are food insecure. That's more than double the number since 2020, just three years. Driven by inflation, climate change, and conflict, the sheer size and scope of this issue means that there's no quick fix one solution. It'll require collaboration across geographies and sectors to improve new and creative solutions. And these inspiring leaders are announcing Clinton Global Initiative commitments to action to alleviate food insecurity. Though they take very different approaches, they all understand the importance and the many facets of this complex issue. They know that food is about more than just hunger or individual survival. It's also about dignity. It's culture and connection to our homelands, to our ancestors, to our need for community. It's economic opportunity. It's about health and fueling our very potential. It's also tied inextricably to our environment and the health of our planet. Sustainable Harvest International is committing to restore more than 12,000 acres of degraded land and increased crop production to provide food security and dignified livelihoods for 8,000 people in Honduras. You can clap for that. Please clap. Educating smallholder farmers in agroecology and business practices will support the environment and accelerate economic growth. In North Carolina, where nearly 590,000 people are food insecure. Can you believe that? Carolina Farm Chest is committing to strengthening local food systems and creating equitable, affordable ways to distribute food from farms to tables. A first of its kind local foods production center will create jobs, will increase access to food, and stimulate the local farming community. With 31% of the world's food either lost after harvest or wasted by retail and consumers, Nilus and the Tarsadia Foundation are committing to using cutting edge technology to rescue food because, before it becomes waste and to lower the cost of healthy food for lower income people. Through their commitment, Solid Africa Community Benefit Company will increase equitable access to free nutritional meals for patients across 47 public hospitals in Rwanda through creation of the Institute of Culinary Arts and Nutrition. This will help develop the culinary workforce and democratize healthy and diverse food for Rwandans. These commitments to action are leading the way to alleviate global food insecurity. And these organizations challenge all of us to ask ourselves how we can join them at the table to take action. And I cannot wait to see what all of you accomplish. I would like to present this to you. And I think somebody wants to take a picture. Thank you all, congratulations. Okay, and now I'd like to invite our speakers, Louise, Gita, and Nona to join me at our ta table. <laughs> Louise Mabulo, founder of the Cacao Project, Gita Mehta, founder and president of Asia Initiatives, and Nona Yahia, Chief Executive Officer of Vertical Harvest. Welcome. All right, let's get right to it. 
Louise, I want to start with you. You've traveled the farthest to come here today, so thank you. Um, your origin story, the Cacao Project, began in the aftermath of a typhoon that struck your community in the Philippines in 2016. Can you share what motivated you to launch the Cacao Project, what your original vision was, and what you've accomplished for the farmers, the community, and the environment in that region? Thanks so much, Padman. Absolutely. Interestingly enough, I began my career really, really early at the age of 12 after I was a finalist on a TV reality show. And that launched me into the world's earliest culinary career. Um, and it brought me to the advocacy of farm-to-table food, really highlighting what goes on beyond the table, what goes on beyond the food that we're enjoying on our plates and the people and the faces behind them. But the fact is the Philippines is one of the most vulnerable regions to hazards brought about by climate change. And my life changed when Super Typhoon Noc 10 impacted my community and destroyed 80% of agricultural land. And this meant that moms and farmers and grandmas would have a hard time putting their kids through school. They'd lose their income. And so I started the Cacao Project as this initiative to rethink food systems. Because for as long as farmers are operating in a system that is constantly battering against them, they're going to be surviving instead of living. So the Cacao Project establishes these agroforests and diversifies these farms to maximize their land stewardship and teaches farmers how to build their own enterprises. Uh, that way they take control of the food system and they have full access to the whole supply chain. So our project has worked with over 200 farmers. We've planted over 150,000 trees and farmers are able to continue putting their kids through school, build resilience, be stewards to our landscapes and do more than just survive every year, but really take control of their lives and hopefully reform the way we approach food systems as a whole. It's incredible what you've managed to achieve. Thank you so much. Geetha, I want to come to you. Your visit today is motivated by the launch of a new CGI commitment to action you're announcing. Um, why don't you share with us the story of how COVID-19 impacted the growth, with the growth of vegetable gardens in rural India and also how that led to a plan for economic empowerment through neighborhood farming share. Farming there. Okay. Thank you. Yes, so I think a lot of people here know that during COVID, a lot of uh, uh, low-skilled laborers came back to their villages in India um, by the millions. Uh, but in the villages, there were no jobs and there were no resources to really, um, you know, get enough food and enough, uh, enough uh, you know, live a good life. So we started with 6,000 women, uh, these vegetable farms. And that turned out to be so successful in uh, helping people get nutritious food for their families on the table, but also be able to sell the excess and so have some money. Uh, so this was uh, uh, so, uh, so successful that now the number has grown to nearly 9,000. But then the women were super enth enthusiastic because it's not just about uh, money and about food, but it's about coming together. So social capital and bringing people together is one big thing we believe in and we do. Uh, so now our commitment here is that we are going to connect all these women to urban markets so that they can sell their additional produce uh, for much better money. Uh, and uh, so, uh, this is our commitment, but we are also going to help them to learn financial literacy, uh, to learn packaging, marketing, branding of their uh, organic produce. But then, as Reverend Barber said, that when babies are coming down the river, you should also look upstream. So we look upstream. And we think that the issue is that we measure too much in money, mm. right? So. Uh, we have three types of capital, uh, social, financial, and ecological. And the world is mostly focused on uh, financial capital, and we challenge that. So we try to build social capital in our communities, and we also have a community currency for social good, uh, where you help your uh, village or your community, you earn this, it goes into your app, and you spend it on your own education, healthcare, and upskilling and microcredit. So that's our commitment. 
So Nona, like Gita, you're also an architect, and you've looked at the often overlooked potential of urban infrastructure you know, as a resort to both feed and employ urban communities. Could you share that story of vertical harvest with us? It is very impressive. I went online and I, it looks beautiful, first of all. So please tell us what that's about. Well, thank you, Padma. Um, and thank you for inviting me to this table with these amazing and inspiring figures. Like Gita, we talked about this earlier. I believe that architecture is a powerful and transformative vehicle for change. And I've rooted my career in that, that the buildings and systems that make up the fabric of our societies can and need to be designed to address 21st century challenges and all members of 21st century society, especially those on the margins. This is a long held belief for me. I am a sister of a brother with disabilities. And as a daughter of first generation Lebanese immigrants, I know my parents came to this country to give us both the best of what it could offer. And I think I was an advocate before I even understood what the word meant. Uh, because I knew that the systems, the social structures in our society were not designed to support him the way they were designed to support me. Not everyone had a seat at the table. So as we're having this national and global conversation about infrastructure, my work has always been focused on how can we reconsider infrastructure to better serve our cities and to design systems that amplify and facilitate human connection. Because we all know, sitting in this room, that sustainable and connected communities are successful ones. And Reverend Barber, I would also like him on my morning uh, <laughs> routine. So at Vertical Harvest, we fervently believe that food is the strongest connection to human and environmental health. Yesterday, I heard it be said over and over to well-being. And the way we currently grow and distribute food is neither stable nor resilient. We all struggled with that over the last three years, but especially for vulnerable populations. And make no mistake, food will be the defining issue of the 21st century. Mm -hmm. yep. States and cities across the globe are recognizing that we need to shake things up, we need to do things differently. And localizing the food system at scale is one of these tools. So I'm a farmer. I never thought I'd be a farmer. Um, and I think an indoor farm is a new type of civic infrastructure that utilizes food to solve multiple problems simultaneously. Climate change is not just an environmental issue. It's a public health issue. It's a social justice issue. It's an economic resiliency issue. And we envision a food system where regardless of race, gender, social identity, everyone has the right to healthy food. So our farm in Wyoming, yes, Wyoming, that we started eight years ago, started with a simple mandate, responsibly grow as much food as possible indoors. We only have a four month growing season and employ people who have historic barriers to entry. In our community, people with disabilities have an 85% unemployment rate. This is national, global. So uh, we wanted to do both year round and this is how we became vertical farmers designing and operating large-scale urban farms that grow better food and futures, where food becomes our medium for positive change. And we've seen that we can build a national network of hyper-local urban farms, where the farm is conceived as a, an essential part of the community, growing over two million pounds of produce, where it is kept within a 150-mile radius, and 40% of our farmers have some sort of intellectual or physical disability. We are all neuro neurodiverse, but we have to set the table to be able to enable people to be able to access new industries and new ways of problem solving. So our farmers have been our leaders and our community builders of tomorrow as we expand across the country, and we are expanding. We have a new farm that is outside of Portland, Maine, Detroit, Cleveland, multiple other municipalities. So that is how I got to food. It's exciting <laughs> and inspiring. <laughs> Louise, you know, as you grapple with the growing impact of climate change and extreme weather, which, you know, the Philippines will always be susceptible to, what practices and growing or growing strategies, say, have you learned in working with your local farmers? And how did you persuade the farmers to trust you? 
Right, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you seem almost like a teenager, so. Like, <laughs> I'm very I'm impressed of being a teenager. By you. How, did the, how did you get them to come on board also? Definitely. Um, so addressing the first question, Padma, the fact is food systems account for nearly 30% of global greenhouse gas emissions. And it's also the industry that's most easily transitioned to be a solution to climate change. But because farmers are smallholders and at the lead, you can't really teach a farmer living on day-to-day -day subsistence to be climate smart or an environmentalist until you change the system surrounding them. And the fact is sustainable farming has been something that has existed for centuries already. People have done this. 50 years ago, food was just food and farming was just farming. And when did that change? Um, as you mentioned, it kind of changed when our end goal in food systems was to move into trade. So the end goal of food systems is just to, to trade globally. But now we're rethinking that and looking at the way we're farming. And that means um, really marrying all of this old knowledge and wisdom that our communities could teach us with the new knowledge and know-how that we have of regenerative agriculture and food systems and making sure that it's accessible to farmers, that it's easier. Through their livelihoods, they're actually helping the environment and it's the more um, profitable option, that it incentivizes them to be environmentalists as they're working. So things like, of course, planting according to season, no-till, agroforestry, creating these economic forest ecosystems that provide more services to the farmers, whether that's windbreakers and typhoons, whether that's day-to-day -day subsistence food, or even a whole livelihood, um, just really practical, easy, scalable solutions that they can understand. Um, and the fact is, many of our farmers have been teaching me crazy stories of planting rocks under root crops or whistling for wind and even planting according to lunar cycles that have proven effective and have helped us build resilience because it's returning to a system of how we best understood our landscapes. And how did I get them to trust me? I was 18 when I started this, so I was a teenager. Yeah. Um, but fact is, when I was a chef and doing all this culinary, I was buying from these farmers. They were aunties and grandmas and people I loved. And then they were kind of like, why is this little girl suddenly interested in farming? So when we tried to scale it, and I said, just trust me for a second, like listen to me and give it a go, um, they were becoming profitable. Many of the farmers before coming here were at a trade fair telling me how they just bought like a flat screen TV or got laser eye surgery from their income of you know, producing chocolates, which is incredible. And it's like um, an actual case study of these anecdotal information of how it's effective. And other farmers were like, hang on, I want to do that too. And because it was just uh, this case study of what was effective and what worked for them in a way they best understood and made sense, people started understanding what our mission was and getting on board with it. So it's no longer a system of survival, as I mentioned earlier, but prosperity and overabundance and overflowing in a way that works locally with our ecosystems and landscapes that is practical and understandable for a smallholder farmer in the Philippines. Brava. Good. <laughs> And Geeta, the project you're announcing today is born out of your organization's work linking women to both economic and social empowerment. And as we know, when we empower women, we empower the whole community. Exactly. So would you share, please, the details of that work and how we can apply it to other communities around the world? Thank you, thank you. Uh, yes, so we strongly believe that people who are closest to the problems are also closest to solutions. Okay. So all our projects uh, have to be pro-women, pro-poor, pro-environment, and people design the project. So our community currency is called SOX, or Social Capital Credits, a little bit inspired by carbon credits, but better. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, so we hold Socratic dialogues uh, where uh, women and and their families come together. They design the sock earning and redeeming menus, and then uh, uh, put a sock value on each, and then they begin to transact. There's also P2P transactions, so people can transact services without money. Uh, but the magic actually comes when people really take charge of their own projects. Mm -hmm. um, our technology, we call it persuasive technology for behavior change. And the behavior change in women is so heartening. You know, before they were like, you know, looking down with their big veil on the head and then they become in charge, which is really fabulous. Uh, so we really uh, do that. And also we have a program called the Cascade of Upskilling. Because you cannot upskill 
so many people, uh, you have to upskill, right? In farming and uh, so what we do is, for example, uh, in rice farming, rice paddies are the biggest, one of the biggest polluters, yeah. right? Methane gas. Uh, so we teach uh, a new system, which is the system of rice intensification. We taught it to 500 women, and they are teaching it to 1,000, who are teaching it to 2,000. So it's like a cascade. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so we crowdsource upskilling. Uh, and uh, everybody who's teaching then is earning social capital credits, which they can use for their own, um, you know, healthcare, education, upskilling, and microcredit. Uh, so, uh, and then you know, people take charge of the project. So we are simply facilitators. You're just seeding it, and exactly, then they take it over. and then it grows. So now the our projects have we call ourselves Asia initiatives, but we are in Ghana, Kenya. Taiwan and United States. So it's a hyper uh, local, you use the word hyper local, yes. It's a hyper local uh, community currency because people design it. Mm -hmm. And they design it to suit whatever is needed. It seems like the tentacles are very far reaching. Exactly, right? yes. Right. And Nona, I, I want to point out that your company is a for profit undertaking. And it's also a means to impact social goals. And I want you to talk about that because the ways in which you're able to utilize vertical harvest business model um, and yet meet the standards of the communities in which you're located is very interesting to me. So what are the financial challenges that you know, such an investment entails? Because it's, it's pretty remarkable. It's a great example also to other corporations. Well, there are many. <laughs> As I can imagine. And, and I wake up every morning saying, well, we just have to keep going, right? I, and, and I think that it's really understanding the why of your in existence as a, as, a building, as a business, building a business. So our colleagues and competitor, competitors in the controlled environment agriculture space, right, they've used technology to compete with big ag. And we're not out there, we're never going to replace big ag. That's it's just the way we have too many people, as you said, 9 billion people. So um, how can we create tools that supplement this? And hyperlocal is the way we've chosen to do that, right? We're looking at local solutions to global problems and how do we scale that? But we're farmers first, right? Why should vertical farming, why should indoor farming mean something to you, your family, your neighborhood, your city, right? And when you invest in what people care about, that's when I think profitability is, is possible, but that's also the trick, because when you care, people think you're not driving profitability. Right. So it, I think, you know, we're on, we're in a little bit of the Wild West of this kind of catalytic investment, but, you know, we have designed a farm that is smarter, in more environmentally sound and more equitable way to produce food. And I think it's in that intersection, we talked about intersection, that it will be profitable. We've created a beautiful new civic building, right, that's in the heart of the city, that's valued in a community like a public library or a community center. We value and we mm -hmm. uh, nurture these institutions because they mean something to us. So we look at the community as a customer. It's not only about selling to the retail, it's about our anchored institutions that make communities thrive. Our hospitals, our school systems, our nursing homes, our governmental institution. Everybody deserves healthy food. And there's something about our employment model that really means something to people. We've reconnected the farm in an urban center to a farmer, and we've exposed ability, right? We've shown that if you give people a chance, they will lead. And so people come to Vertical Harvest because of our story, but they come back because of the deliciousness and of our product. And I think this is how you build a business. And the impact on our community has been profound. People who were washing hotel rooms and, and uh, cleaning hotel rooms and washing dishes, we all have to start somewhere. The difference is they didn't have access to a career, what means something to you and I, what makes our communities run. And now they're applying to hospital boards, representing DEI in a, affordable housing, you know, being wanting to be part of the DEI local town commission. This was never happening before we, 
you know, gave them an opportunity for employment. I think it's very much in the context of what Reverend Barber set up for us today. So, and you know, that, that trickles down to investors. We took a group of investors to a grocery store and the produce manager said to us, um, you know, uh, it, when people, when we run out of vertical harvest produce, people are visibly angry. You could raise the prices and nobody would blink. And the investors are like, how much did you pay him to say that? <laughs> right? And I think that, you know, that is, that is what you can do. I mean, there are many challenges. But when you, when you create a business that is there for a really authentic, palpable community building reason, well then you have an opportunity to drive real change. Impressive, thank you. <laughs> now we don't have that much time, but I have one last question that's kind of a lightning round for all of you, so please all of you answer this, just whatever comes to your mind quickly. Um, what do you envision as the future growth of your work and what are the next goals you want to conquer? And hopefully all of us are listening so we can help you in whatever way possible. Let's start with you, Louise. I think it's really scaling our food systems that are more sustainable and regenerative and working closer with the smallholder farmers who need that support the most and transition our food systems to something that's climate smart, resilient, and is something that's democratized to people in the global south who are most vulnerable and most reliant to these agricultural livelihoods. Thank you. No, no. Well, we envision seeing a farm in every community, in your community, and every community nationally and globally. But uh, you know, this is a slow process, and we need to keep going with people who will support us. So I envision expanding the investable universe to be able to, you know, to encompass the work that we do because the time is now, right? Their biases are out there, and we don't have time for them. We're at a tipping point, and you know, these issues are too too real for these hurdles to exist to investment. And so we need collaboration and expanding that investable universe in order for these new industries that address our future to take hold. Gita? Uh, so I think that these women farmers we are working with are very bankable and they really need to be connected to the uh, urban markets and global markets. Uh, so our next step is to make uh, uh, social capital credits uh, as a way to build cre credit rating for the women so they can then go to the bank uh, and take the loans uh, if they need to. And also many countries now are thinking about payment for ecosystem services, okay. uh, like communities that are helping uh, preserve our forests, preserve our, our uh, natural systems. Uh, so uh, like in Taiwan, that's why we were invited uh, to see how the government could measure the actions being taken by the farmers and then give them payment for ecosystem services. So I think this is like really a way to empower local farmers, women, and, uh, and, and really connect the world. Uh, uh, Reverend Barbara was talking about this big, uh, you know, gap. So I think that's to what close we... close the gap. Exactly, exactly. Thank you. I want to thank all of our speakers today for telling us about their work, but also inspiring us by their work. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Using nature as our ally in solving the most pressing problems that our society faces is known as nature-based solutions. We've always found nature to be the basis, not just for biodiversity and species, but also for people, whether it's economic systems or crises or social systems. And what's important about nature-based solutions is that we see nature as part of the solution for people and for nature. People around the Lafayette Flats depend on water for their livelihoods. So drip irrigation projects such as this are vital uh, to water uh, usage. Not only are we able to reduce the amount of water that we use, we are able to do more with the little water that we are now extracting from the Lafayette. In a world facing urgent challenges, 
The Postcode Lottery Group supports good causes through funds raised by 14 million lottery players in five European countries. By using postal codes as ticket numbers, communities win together in monthly draws, with a minimum of 30% of the ticket price benefiting charities. This makes the group one of the largest private charity donors, driving significant change. Happy Postcode Lottery winners! Each and every day of the year, neighbors and communities win together. Players raise 2.3 million euros for good causes every single day. This means an incredible 12.5 billion euros has been raised since the start. More importantly, it is all about the positive impact these funds make. We support hundreds of partners with long-term unrestricted funding. Organizations, both small and large, local and international, have the freedom to use funding in the best possible way. The Postcode Lottery Group is committed to making a difference. Worldwide Fund for Nature and IFRC has received 6 million euros of flexible funding to implement nature-based solutions in multiple countries, including Mozambique, Kenya, and the Philippines. At the end of the day, people are the ones who are affected, and the people live in the community. And when people and nature live in harmony, that's how we can address reducing the impact of the climate-related disasters. Together, we aim to accelerate the implementation of nature-based solutions and create a more resilient future for people all around the world. Together, we will continue to transform lives and communities at a time when it's needed most, making the world a better place. And together, we will keep making a difference. Please welcome Ime Roch, Caroline Holt, Fernanda D. Carvalho, and Mikel Verboven. We cannot alleviate human suffering nor ensure proper protection of people without also working together with nature. Environmental degradation is reducing the ability of the land to provide sustainable food and water to people. It's also reducing the ability of our ecosystems to provide their natural protection against certain hazards like landslides and floods. Partnerships like ours between the IFRC and WWF are essential to build resilience to the most vulnerable people of the increasingly worsening climate and environmental crises. And we cannot fix the climate crisis without also fixing the nature crisis. Nature-based solutions can play a critical role in restoring balance to our climate. Nature-based solutions harness the power of nature to boost natural ecosystems, biodiversity, and human well-being to address major societal issues, including climate change. WWF works to deliver high-quality based nature-based solutions that are based on science, led by communities and informed by traditional and local knowledge. This is one way we help communities adapt to devastating impacts of climate change. We are proud to be working with organizations like the IFRC and the Postcode Lottery. Working together is essential if we are to successfully tackle climate change and nature loss. Through our partnership, the IFRC with WWF commit to alleviating and reducing the devastating impacts of climate change, disasters, and food insecurity that all communities face. Thank you. Every year, Malaria claims the lives of more than half a million people and infects hundreds of millions more, with our children suffering the most. Despite decades of progress on anti-malarial treatments, today we're facing new challenges. The effects of climate change have increased the threat of malaria around the world, specifically in Africa. Over 90% of malaria deaths uh, happens in Africa. And apart from death, Disease also interferes with uh, people's lives, education, 
economic activities, and also the society's economy. Access to key components for anti-malarial drug production is subject to large price fluctuations in an unstable marketplace. Without a sustainable, reliable, and affordable solution, millions more could die senselessly of this devastating disease. One partner taking action to combat this preventable disease is Domuschiev Impact. Domuschiev Impact is a new platform within the holding company I co-founded with my brother Georgi. Domus Chief Impact will lead our philanthropic and sustainability efforts to enact change within our many companies, including Huve Pharma. Huve Pharma has been a leader in the global health and sustainability community as the only WHO qualified and authorized manufacturer of critical components needed for anti-malarial treatments. Domus Chief Impact is thrilled to announce its first CGI commitment to action, building on our already recognized capabilities in manufacturing groundbreaking anti-malarial treatments. We are investing $5 million to develop a new global anti-malaria center, the result of decades of research focused on bringing to market a truly competitive, non-profit, no-loss treatment for malaria. Our investments are possible through the manufacturing innovation and strength of our companies and the personal philanthropic commitment of our family. I want to thank Kirill very much uh, for all he has done to support CGI. President Clinton knows the power of innovation and entrepreneurship to change the world. And his work with the Clinton Global Initiative is synonymous with action in service to humanity. We both share the simple belief that everyone deserves a chance to succeed. And we all do better when we work together. Please welcome to the stage, Chef J Jose Andres, Louise Mabulo, Cindy McCain, and President Bill Clinton. Well, good morning, everyone. I, I presume everybody's wide awake now that Reverend Barber <laughs> led our revival. He's amazing. No? He's great. Um, we want to follow up on uh, this whole issue of food insecurity. Uh, for Americans, it's a truly ironic dilemma when we have so many people in this country who are at risk of type 2 diabetes because they're overweight. And it's so easy to forget that food insecurity is a big problem in the United States. But it's devastating in a lot of the places where Cindy McCain works with the World Food Program because of the combination of the impact of the Ukraine war, COVID, and a whole variety of natural disasters which have made agriculture more problematic. But I think before this Ukraine conflict developed, most people didn't know that 30 percent of the world's wheat is grown in that little space of land between Russia and Ukraine. So. I think I'd like to start with you, Cindy. How do you see this, this food security problem worldwide? What do you need? What should all of us be doing to help? Well, Mr. President, thank you very much for covering this issue and for letting us uh, up here be able to uh, inform the general public, but also uh, make sure that you understand the depth of this. Uh, from the World Food Program perspective, the world's on fire. Uh, this is nothing to play with now. This is not just an issue that exists. This is desperation. 
we have hundreds of millions, hundreds of millions of people that are not just food insecure, but don't know where their next meal is going to come from. We have hundreds of millions of children who are food insecure. Uh, and, and so what does that mean? That means more migration. It means more uh, uh, people moving and fighting and, and turmoil beginning and starting and continuing. Uh, in our case, we view food insecurity as a national security issue because that's what's going to happen if we don't step up and make sure that we have enough money globally to be able to take care of these people so they stay in their homes, stay in their communities, and feed their families, and are able to feed their families. So, Mr. President, I, I, w I never have good news. My job is not the good news agency at all. Uh, I wish I did on occasion. But, but it's time that not just the governments step up to this, but that pri the private sector joins us in this. Because without the private sector, we're not going to be able to supplement what we really need. And we are half the amount of funding right now that we should be in this particular situation. Uh, lastly, uh, I'll speak directly to Africa, North Africa particularly. Um, we're looking at just a spark and, and the entire area is going to implode with chaos, and more chaos than, than is already there, but no food. So that sends people running. I am scared for the first time in this job. I'm scared for what's going to happen. Jose. <laughs> <laughs> On that note. <laughs> Uh-oh. No, I, this is interesting. I was thinking about all the places We've been together over the years. How you came to my library when COVID was wreaking havoc. Uh, and we served almost a million meals there. But uh, we were in <coughs> the Caribbean when the storms came in 2017. We'd, we'd, you've been everywhere. I remember we were standing with those, that young married uh, couple in, on their little seven acres in Puerto Rico, and they showed us how they had grown something on every inch of land. All the places and all the things you've done and, and what you did on the border of Colombia and Venezuela, which meant a great deal to me. So we're now dealing I think with a, a terrible moment in the conflict uh, in U Ukraine. And so just using that as an example, how are you approaching these crises? And how can you help in terms of being a pipeline for what Cindy talked about? We need, I think there's a lot more money out there that the private sector would give for food insecurity, particularly in emergency situations, if they knew how it was going to be spent and what the consequences would be? Well, uh, Mr. President, uh, talking about Ukraine, um, um, Ukraine for us, for World Central Kitchen, was very much uh, the last 14 years that we have uh, gaining experience. I believe World Central Kitchen, we're an organization that we are a baby organization. We, we, are, we are used learning, learning from the big brothers, learning from the men and women of organizations like World, world Food Program. I've been very lucky to be with many of them sometimes in different parts of the world and learning about the amazing uh, work they do um, every day. And by the way, I think this is a moment to give a huge round of applause to every single humanitarian out there around the world with boots on the ground, feeding people or taking care of people. Can we do that? Great. This always happens, great, when you don't know what you are about to say and you gain time to think about what you are going to say next. <laughs> this is a tip. But in Ukraine, something very simple happened. Something needs to be very clear. We all need to be next to President Zelensky and next to the people of Ukraine. <laughs> Another thing needs to be very clear. Why is World Food Program in Ukraine feeding? and World Central Kitchen feeding, 
when Ukraine is a country that exports huge amounts of food. Why are we there? World Central Kitchen went there in part because when chaos happens, the infrastructure of a country breaks down. And what we did was not bringing food from the outside, but just trying to reorganize the broken infrastructure of no supermarkets, places with no bridges, uh, farmers that were stopping uh, producing, and I start trying to build it again. When restaurants were closed, what we tried to do, like, hey, we need to feed this shelter and this hospital. Can you open? And so we support you with money so you can feed all these people. We put together more than 500 restaurants doing more than 500,000 home meals in the early days, weeks, and months of the war to take care of all those refugees. Who better, my people, than restaurants and caterings and kitchens in hotels to feed people? So this is what World Central Kitchen does. We don't try to reinvent infrastructure. We are an organization that we are not about hardware. We are more about software. We are here. We look around. What do we have that we can take care of people? And this is very much what we did. When you mentioned that this goes connected with the issue we're facing in the world today, uh, seeing this right, this food is a national security issue. President Clinton, governments need to be taking care of giving more importance to food. Presidents of every country must have a national security food advisor next to them. And you remember that everybody tells you that there's enough food to feed the world? You remember that we keep saying it's enough food to feed the world? But what happened? We are wasting food? Imagine when we wake up one day and there is no anymore that we waste. But imagine one day that we don't have enough food to feed the world. Ukraine, I just came back visiting farmers, and many of them told me that this crop this year, the crop is going to be 50% from before the war. A country that feeds 500 million people every year with the grain they produce, this is for United Nations, for every government in the world, to be taking a, a, a serious look at the situation of Ukraine, because it's not only a war for Ukraine to gain their freedom, but it is also a war to feed the world. Okay. This is the situation we are facing right now. I agree with that. I, Louise agreed to come back and do double duty here because <laughs> why don't we not be political? I'll commit the truth here. <laughs> the, the, the president of Malawi was jammed up in UN traffic. <laughs> As one does. Aggravated, I'm ashamed to say, it's, no, it's not his fault, by President Biden's arrival, which got more <laughs> security people and traffic directors involved. The poor man is doing his best to get here. And he's really done an interesting, I think, set of work on this. But I ask, Luis to come back because I think it's important to point out that it does matter where this food is grown. And we do need more resilient agriculture from small farmers that are providing the food where people live or near where they live. And it's a huge deal. I, um, I have spent a lot of years trying to convince people that this was a charitable project worth investing in, almost always without success. The biggest ones of these programs are funded uh, by, well, Aliko Dangote funds 180,000 farmers in Nigeria. Um, and almost all the other programs are smaller in number. We have never had a, an international program committed to funding millions and millions and millions of small farmers to produce food and keep it where they live. And a lot of these people are every bit as productive 
as big industrial scale agriculture if they had the feed, seed, fertilizer, farming techniques, and the ability to move the food from the ground where it's grown to the place where it will be consumed. So I, I thought I'd, you could maybe say a little about that. What, how do you feel that the current situation in the world is affecting uh, your small farmers and their vi your vision of resilient farming, and what else do you think we need to do? Absolutely. Thank you so much, Mr. President, for having me on this panel. I have big shoes to fill uh, with the president of Malawi stuck in traffic, but I'm grateful to him uh, for being stuck in traffic. <laughs> I cannot lie. <laughs> <laughs> but the fact is, Mr. President, nearly $500 billion worth of agricultural subsidies exist and are circulating around the world. But it's very hard to feel that when you're in this tiny pocket of um, San Fernando and Camarines Sur, which is, you've never even heard of it, it's eight-hour drive from Manila. And most of these subsidies are going into unsustainable agriculture, large monocropping. And how can we transition that into regenerative agriculture? How do we put it in the hands of the farmers who need them the most? Um, in fact, agriculture and farming and food is inherently a political act. All of us eat three times a day. We're all reliant on a farmer somewhere. And Frankly, they're the most underserved, underprivileged group in places like the Global South that provide most of our food. Um, it's a climate act as well. Less than 1% of climate finance was put into food and land use systems in, I think it was 2020 or 2021. So I think it's really important that we start looking at the intersections of our food systems and how we can give farmers more autonomy and more freedom to act within where they're working on um, and also have a seat at the table, provide these solutions that already exist within their communities. Again, wisdom from hundreds of years of knowledge passed down from grandmother to grandson and be able to modernize that and also scale it in a way that we can either find the parallels of places across the world, whether that's farms here in the US and uh, technology in the Philippines, or whether that's also putting farmers on policy tables, on um, understanding where climate finance or even finance in general needs to get uh, on the ground. and. Beyond that, I think it's also important to have um, more than hundreds of thousands of movements that empower them because this is a heavily stigmatized industry where farmers are oftentimes associated to poverty or uh, unsustainable development. So essentially we need more people showing and giving power to farmers and we need hundreds of thousands of more initiatives like Chef Jose Andres's um, kind of programs and hopefully we need more hundreds and thousands of you, Chef, across the world mobilizing within the communities that they're doing that to bring food and close those consumer uh, and production gaps. Thank you. Cindy, what's the budget of the World Food Program? Um, I, last year, it was six, 15, 16 billion. This year, we're down to half of that. Now, why? Why is that? Um, it's not because anything was misspent or any of that. It's just the needs are such now. The needs are greater. There's more people. There's more uh, uh, inability to move around and to get things done. We're affected by cost, COVID, climate change, and all the others. And also, countries have kind of decided they're not interested. I'll be honest with you. There's a certain... Uh, lack of interest in food security now from, I'll speak to the EU, I'll speak to uh, other, other European countries, other Middle Eastern countries, etc. We need everybody in this fight. This is not a fight for the United States alone. This, we need absolutely everybody we can get. And it's not just about emergency food, it's about uh, sustainability. It's about giving these farmers, these prospective farmers, these these refugees who are in camps, the tools to, to, to build a little farm and feed their families. No one wants to leave their home. No one does. But you will do anything to feed your family. So, so we, uh, do, that's another part, portion of what WP does is the sustainability and the, and the, the long-term uh, buy-in for all of this. Uh, it, what we, we're in, uh, as uh, Chef Andrea said, we are definitely in Ukraine, and part of what we are doing is is helping a demining organization demine the, the agricultural plots so that we, they can farm again. 
but that's a huge problem in, in, within Ukraine, and it's going to be a long-lasting problem, too, two, I know. Two farmers died yesterday, yeah. only because they were yeah. trying to take care of their land. Just two farmers died yesterday. So, Stephen Mons. And the, tra the uh, tractor just blow away. Blew up, yeah, yeah. No, 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 you're exactly right. It's just to put it in perspective, you every week is farmers dying because they are trying to feed their families. Yeah. Yay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh -oh. Give him a hand for... Hello. Hello, Mr. Thank you. Can I sit by you? <laughs> May I apologize on behalf of my city for the traffic? <laughs> <laughs> we're glad to see you, President Sequeira. Thank you. And we've just been talking about the current state of food insecurity because um, of all the people who need access because of the demands that are particular to Ukraine. Right. Because of the falling international support. And uh, Louise is from the Philippines, and she was describing how much is spent subsidizing farmers that doesn't reach to the individual farmers right. who determine literally life or death for a lot of people in a lot of communities. Now, it, this president has an interesting background. Uh, he has lots of education in both his religious studies and in his work today in agriculture. So if you're rested up enough, all right. <laughs> Tell us what the state of play is in Malawi, where I have had the, my foundation has had the honor to work for many years on many things, including agriculture. And That's right. how are you doing? And what, do you, what does the world need to know about the condition of sustainable uh, food in Africa? Well, Mr. President, it's a long a question, but uh, I, I'll see what I can do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the food situation in Malawi, particularly, and then you can talk about Africa in general, um, has been exacerbated by various factors. In um, about five of so years in Malawi, we have had several cyclones. We've had incidents of flooding and sometimes even drought in certain parts. And the most devastating cyclone this year, Freddy, in all of our history has been uh, catastrophic. I mean, over a thousand people were killed the fields, the crops just washed out, whole villages obliterated, and 2.6 million people affected, uh, infrastructure destroyed. Right now, we have close to 5 million people food insecure. But that has been a kind of building up uh, system because of the climate shock, uh, you know, uh, uh, climate change shocks. And so with um, that, and then you add uh, the war in Eastern Europe, because what that did was to affect supply chain issues, including food supplies across the continent and all of a sudden, prices of food and fuel and fertilizers 
you know, just went up. And many countries like Malawi that are struggling with the debt burden. Uh, we just couldn't have all of the resources needed to even recover sufficiently to make sure everybody is covered. Now we have this, um, a program we call AIP, which is um, Agricultural Inputs kind of program to help farmers, many of whom are subsistent. You know, we call them smallholder farmers. But we do help subsidize so that they have at least sufficient food to cover them a, a year per household. So we want to have food sufficiency on a household level, but we also want to have food sufficiency on a national level. Now what happens is when these villages and their fields get wiped out like they did, then on a household level, there's hardly any food. And so what we want to do now is to make sure that uh, we, we have mechanized mega farms and then try to teach the folks how to get in groups, cooperatives, produce more uh, of quality and mechanize so that, um, you know, agriculture should not be looked at as subsistence just so I can survive a season or a day, but big business. And that's what's happening in Malawi now. So that the hope is coming back to say we can have food sufficiency um, and more to export. Because Malawi is blessed with arable land and beautiful valleys and lakes. The biggest lake, Malawi, third largest in Africa. And uh, we don't see why we should be struggling. So the investment that is needed is in agriculture big time so that we can then forget about food insecurity. Does that make sense? <laughs> I'm a farm boy. <laughs> you want to say anything? What, what's your reaction to what he said? I think it's incredible to see the amount of work being mobilized within food systems, such a big industry that we're working in, and to think we need 70% more food by 2050. And FAO recently released a report that shows we have 60 years worth of harvest left, so it's work like this that needs to accelerate in order to be able to empower farmers and make sure that farmers have the resilience and resources they need. Mm -hmm. But also I've noticed we've had a lot of issues and problems around food systems. It's constantly, um, as you mentioned, you never come with good news, isn't that right? But fact is, there is a lot of optimism and hope for food systems. We can reimagine development using farming techniques and practices and technologies. Um, hopefully we can one day build cities where infrastructure is resilient, where forests are integrated as part of it. And I hope that um, countries like ours in the global south are going to create that model and that scale because we have the capacity and we have the history and the land to do so. I was going to uh, try to figure out, because we're a little, we've got five minutes left for four, but Jose, most of the time, when I see you, we've been working in some place where the wheels run off. Something terrible's happened, a natural disaster, a political disaster, or whatever. And we don't have to deal with these questions that they're dealing with because we just have to produce the food needed right now under these circumstances. How should the world, how should we be organizing so that we make we not only respond better, more quickly, more fully to immediate emergencies, but also build in a more resilient agriculture system so people can feed themselves on a 
regular basis where they live in good times and bad? Well, uh, Mr. President, I, I'm still doing my MBA and learning with boots on the ground. That's why I try to go everywhere to try to figure out this question. I think everybody here is trying to figure out this question. One thing is clear, the recipes of the past are not working. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's good things happening here and there, but still we keep talking about hungry children, hungry people, the number keeps increasing. Therefore, we need to start writing, in many ways, new recipes. Let's take a look at what's going on in Ukraine. President, here you said that they have a very good fertile land. But much of the grain that is produced in Ukraine today is being exported to other countries around the world, many of them Africa. My question to everybody is, and I want Ukraine to do well because they need to sell what they produce somewhere, but why Africa that still has many areas that they are not maximized to its full farming potential? they have to keep receiving grain from another country far away. We, why we cannot start really investing so those people are self-sufficient? In humanitarian aid. Yeah, you can clap, big way. But <laughs> listen, I was very proud of the role of America when Haiti earthquake happened. But it's just to give you a detail. And I thought USAID did great, and I think the response was something as an American, as a citizen, I was proud. Can you always do things better? Yeah. But let me show you one thing. Talking now about Republicans and Democrats in Congress and about refugees and immigrants in Texas. And now I, I lost you, right? Because I'm talking about immigrants and refugees in Texas and Haiti 14 years ago. And you're saying, Jose, you are really naughty. Yeah, I am. We send so much food for free in Haiti that we put hundreds if not thousands of farmers out of job. That means that doing good is not good enough. We must do a smart good because by not buying from local farmers in Haiti, they went hungry in the process that on paper where we were bringing food. We made that country in a way poorer by doing it wrong. Let's start investing buying locally. That's why in World Central Kitchen when I can, listen, in Ukraine, we invested a ton of money, thanks to the American people supporting us. Uh, over 400 million, probably more. As much as we could, we bought food that was local. In the process of a country that was at war, we were trying to help that country to do better economically. Then the Haitians that we see in the south, in, ha in, in, in Texas and in Tijuana, many of them Haitians, they are the same Haitians that during 14 years they are trying to find a place to belong. Therefore, when you have a senator in Congress in the United States of America that only will give international American aid in the form of food versus in the form of money, they are creating this, the problem that then we have refugees in the rich countries because the only thing they're trying to do is knock on the door because they want to feed their children. That's why I created the Global Food Institute in partnership with George Washington, after 12 years with a class, that we bring the whole of government to try to be more strategically and more pragmatic on when we make a decision to make sure that the decision solves problems, but that that decision and those policies don't create bigger problems. Subsidies, I am a guy that I will stop subsidies tomorrow, especially in the big companies. If we give subsidies to the big companies, let's give subsidies to, to the small farms. Subsidies for all or subsidies for any. As you see, the food, I don't think it's anything more important than food in the wall. Because the energy that moves humanity is not the gas that goes into my car, it's the food that feeds all of us. That's what we, we've been mentioning, that food needs once and for all recognized as a true national food security issue and more importance and more um, investment needs to be done in making sure that our governments have a more holistic food policy. Right now, it doesn't exist. Food policy cannot be only in the hands of the Department of Agriculture in every country. Food needs to be part of every single department in every single government so we can find real solutions to solve the problems we are facing in, in the years to come. So, Having heard all this, 
If your budget were double tomorrow, what would you spend the money on? Oh, I, w I would certainly spend it on the needs that we, we have right now in the, the serious hot spots, the fires around the world. But I would also spend some of it on science, technology, doing more with less, being a better, more efficient organization. That's in the plan for us. But it's so important that we do that for the very reason that you say, unless we're smart about our money, then, then we're just wasting it. And so, so I, I, a really smart friend of mine, who, who I love dearly, uh, has said to me on more than one occasion, the seeds of terrorism are planted in despair. And so, so these are the kinds of things that we're looking at and how we have to deal with this, these things on a daily basis. And also reminding everybody that, that uh, I, I, I feel the same frustration that you do with, with the Congress that doesn't always understand what we're doing. And it, it, it can no longer be just about emergency food. It has to be about sustainability. It has to be about helping people help themselves along the way. And so that's the message that we're trying to give, is not only do we desperately need help now, but for the long term, so that we can keep people at home. And people are happier, they're healthier. They're, they're certainly more, more uh, generous in terms of who they are as a community, but more importantly, their children don't wind up being recruited by terrorist organizations because the terrorist organizations are feeding them. That's what we're faced with right now. I want to congratulate Malawi on what you do because I wish every country had the kind of vision that you do with food and food security and food sustainability. Thank you for that. We, uh, we're out of time, uh, but I will, let me summarize. One, whatever, however big the problem is, there are always gifted, good farmers in every country with the capacity to do more if they have the support they need. And so we should emphasize the empowerment of people at the local level. Two, on the other extreme, there are always natural or political disasters that cannot be met by even the best kind of resilience planning and siloing of food or whatever without people coming in. And he's, Jose Andres, probably the best person that ever lived at doing that. And but he's also trying to fix the other things. So and the third thing we learned is that people from the outside who want to help the uh, need to make first, uh, first be sure they do no harm. And secondly, help now with a view toward making it possible for people to flower and stand on their own mm -hmm. and chart their future. It's a, this is very rewarding work. It's amazing, it's important. Um, and sometimes, quite often, it's life or death. So we need to keep getting better and better and better at it. And uh, we should pontificate less and do more. Mm -hmm. Let's give them a hand. <laughs>